pleasure to welcome Josh Caldwell here from Vanderbilt, all the way from Nashville. Uh, we met just recently, yep. connecting over the Elionics, actually. <laughs> yeah. Check out ask, did you guys get one? Or? We don't know yet. We're on okay. an MRI, <laughs> we're hoping. So if you want to be a reviewer, I'm happy to put your name up. Send it my way. <laughs> this machine is great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> actually, Kaiwen can weigh in on that. He's our kind of our main uh, uh, EV user these days. So kind of question so I guess, here. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this proposal's know. already in, so yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, that, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how much Elionix are gonna give us back. <laughs> <laughs> Kick it down, guys. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Jessica is undergrad from Virginia Tech in two thousand, and his uh, PhD from University of Florida in physical chemistry in two thousand four. Um, actually. Since you were going to the magnet lab around then, so was I. 2003, 2004, I wonder if we overlapped. Yeah, probably. I was going quite notes. often. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, this was followed by uh, 12 years at the Naval Research Lab as postdoc and research scientist. Um, and there's one thing I missed a little bit earlier in there, around uh, 2013 or so. Oh, I just did a sabbatical. Ah, sabbatical. OK. Off. And then in 2017, he moved to Vanderbilt Mechanical Engineering, where he is today working on a variety of projects, including the infrared nanophotonics works, works, excuse me, uh, boron nitride physics, and so forth. So, yep. we'll hand it off to you. Great. Thank you much. Uh, first of all, um, this has been a phenomenal visit so far. I really appreciate it. Excellent discussions. Um, I already have a couple of potential collaborations coming out of it. And what's the purpose of doing these if there's not something that you can do more work afterward? So this is a great start to a day. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. Um, if you have questions in the middle, um, just yell out. I'm happy to just kind of talk and do more of a discussion rather than a real guide through a talk. If uh, there's questions as we go along, make sure we don't lose anybody. Um, the focus of what I'm talking about today is uh, nanophotonics in general. This is the problem with glasses. I can't see this thing while well, I can see the board at the same time. There we go. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it is talking about uh, strong coupling between different types of modes and exploiting uh, really large anisotropy, especially in natural crystalline anisotropy and materials for driving some of these polaritonic media and polaritonic effects. So I like to put this image up to start. Uh, what you're looking at here is a scanning near field optical microscope measurement of hexagonal boron nitride. These little waves that you're seeing here, this is the light propagating through. We're measuring these light, propagate, uh, light waves propagating through, the electromagnetic waves propagating through a slab of hexagonal boron nitride. Here's the edge of my flake up here, and you can see these modes being launched and directly propagating into the So why is this interesting? Well, the wavelength of the light that we're actually measuring with or launching these waves with is about seven microns. The flake that I have on the screen is about seven microns. And so what we're actually doing is by coupling into these polaritonic modes, I'm able to take that long wavelength infrared light and compress it down to deeply subdiffractional dimensions, such that here, these wavelengths are on the order of a couple hundred uh, nanometers rather than being a few microns. Okay, so this kind of hedges into this talk. Uh, the first question of the talk, which of course I've already given you the answer to, is, is this possible? Well. If you really think about the challenge though, if I start thinking about uh, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, when I'm in the visible spectral range, right, I'm already at 100-ish nanometer wavelengths of light, I'm kind of already in the nanoscale range, right? So nanophotonics, just using high dielectric and uh, high refractive index materials, you're basically doing nanophotonics. I don't need to create some new optical mode to do this. However, when you start to push into the infrared, especially in the two atmospheric windows of three to five, and uh, uh, eight to fourteen, uh, eight to twelve microns, where you're in the mid wave and long wave infrared. These, even if I have a refractive index of four, I'm still roughly micron or larger, right? So getting into nanophotonics really is impossible just with purely dielectric media, unless I'm working around resonances and things like that. And so this then begs this challenge: How can we actually do this? <clears throat> So one of the ways to do this is to create what's called a polariton. Effectively, we need to have a new way for light and matter to interact. And I'm no longer gonna let it just be light. I'm gonna create this hybridized state called a polariton, which is effectively a coupling or strong coupling between 
the photon of light, and some oscillating charge. And so what does this actually mean? Well, if I'm doing strong coupling, I'm effectively taking these two, I'm taking two oscillators and I'm coupling, uh, coupling them together in such a way that they exchange energy faster than they decay, right? And so this exchange is going back and forth between the photon and this charged particle. And so because of that, you end up getting hybrid properties, much like taking two atoms together to form a molecule. The molecule is not just the simple sum of the parts, it's derived from those atoms, but you get new properties based off of how they bond and how they interact. So here I'm taking that wavelength of light, and I'm beginning to compress it down to that of the, the wavelength of the charged particle. So if you think of an electron, like in a uh, conductor, this can then push this towards something like the de Broglie wavelength. So shrinking that wavelength down a great deal. Uh, so this gives us ways to overcome this, right? So there's a whole suite of different types of flaretons. Uh, this is from a review from Dmitry Basov's group, where if I look at strictly at two-dimensional materials, I can look at uh, uh, this charge being played by electrons or holes in a conductor. So of course, in 2D, 2D materials, the exemplary material is just graphene. I can also use the ionic charge in a lattice, right? So if I have a polar bond, silicon carbon rather than silicon, uh, I can also induce what's called a phonon flareton. Here, the exemplary material is hexagonal boron nitride. I'll talk about this a little bit today. You can also look at more exotic forms, exton flaretons, Cooper pair flaretons and superconductors, magnon flaretons, vibrational flaretons, molecular pl all sorts of different varieties. Today, we're going to be talking about these two. And part of this, the first part of the talk, I'll get into some kind of application-specific uh, work, and then I'll move into some more of the fundamental physics, uh, fundamental processes that we look at in these systems. So if I think of uh, plasmon flaretons, I can look at the basic material properties of a metal or a conductor to really derive where this comes from. So if I think of simple silver, and I think of why is this reflective? Well, if I come in with an electromagnetic field, I induce this charge to move, right? This oscillating charge of these electrons sets up a surface screening field, which causes that high reflectivity we associate with. Right. Well, we mathematically define this as something that has a negative real part of the dielectric function, negative permittivity. Quite literally, it doesn't permit the radiation into the material, right? And it's within this regime where I can now couple light to these polaritons, uh, to uh, the oscillating charges to create polaritons. So effectively, if I have a negative permittivity value, I can make a polariton. How good it's going to be, how long it's going to propagate, these are all material-centric problems, but in uh, particular, if I have that negative permittivity, you can form a polariton. Um, this allows me to then confine light to subdifractional dimensions. But if I'm thinking of the infrared or terahertz, I'm looking mostly at highly doped semiconductors rather than gold or silver like you would look at for the visible. Now, in case of phonon polaritons, if I take, for instance, silicon, car uh, silicon carbide, <clears throat> I can see the same effect. Because of the difference in electronegativity between these two, uh, uh, the silicon and carbon atoms, the carbon is going to be partially negative, silicon is going to be partially positive. And so if I shine light, but now at a frequency between the longitudinal and transverse optic phonons, this lattice oscillation, this optic phonon, is going to induce a similar, sur similar surface screening field that then causes a high reflectivity. Right? And so if I look, for instance, at silicon, carbon, uh, silicon carbide, we get this band. So between the TO and LO phonons, the, high, uh, the reflectivity can be actually higher than that of traditional metals in the same spectral range. So if you measure the reflectivity of silicon, carbon, uh, silicon carbide, I don't know why I keep saying silicon carbon, uh, silicon carbide in the spectral range, you actually get something over 100% because you're comparing it to gold and some of the lo absorptive loss in gold is worse than that of silicon, uh, silicon carbide. Now, if I look at the permittivity, this just gives rise to the same negative permittivity Thus, I can form clariton, thus I can uh, uh, support subdifractional modes. Now, there's a couple of key distinctions between these two. The first, obviously, is this is derived by these optic phonons. I now have a band over which I can support these. It's between the trio and the yellow phonon. Outside of that spectral band, you're not going to be able to do this. If I'm looking at a conductor, anything below the plasma frequency will work. This also means that the dispersion is going to be quite fast. So the rate at which the permittivity is changing is very, very fast compared to that of a plasmonic system. Because your group velocity is just the derivative of that, it means the light's going to move very slow. Right? So uh, very slow light propagation in these uh, types of systems compared to that of plasmonic systems. And then the final one is the damping rate. 
In this case, we're driven by optic phonon scattering, which is usually on the order of picoseconds, tens of picoseconds, which is orders of magnitude fast, uh, slower than that of what you get from a plasmonic system, which is usually tens to 100 femtoseconds at best. Um, so if you couple these together, there's certain indications, uh, certain situations where you want to use a plasmonic system, certain where you want to use a, a, a broad tunability, uh, faster uh, propagation of light. There's others where you want this low loss, higher Q mode that you can get with the phonon polariton systems. It's a balance of what you actually need out of your system. Are, um, are Restrolin bands always associated with phonon polariton modes or? Yeah. No. And so now if the damping is too high, you'll see your reflectivity suffers. If the imaginary part of your dielectric function is larger in magnitude than the negative real part of the dielectric function, you won't be, it'll be overdamped and you won't be able to really observe one, but they are still present. So. Okay, and so that Restrolin band certainly limits in any given material, I have a fixed band over which I can support these modes, right? So you could then look across a large spectral range and say, what material systems offer me opportunities to kind of expand the spectral range? And you can see just with diatomic systems, there's a whole wealth of different materials here. There's been a whole new discovery of many others. Molytrioxide has been a really hot one recently, uh, but many others are uh, in this band as well. Okay, so what do these actually look like? Well, if I take a conductive surface, or in this case, think of an optical conductor, so even a phonon polariton could be a purely dielectric system, that negative permittivity is meaning it's a conductive-like surface in the, at that spectral range. If I have this, at this interface, I'm gonna launch this node, and I'm gonna have this evanescent field where this field is gonna extend somewhere above this interface, but it's gonna be confined to that interface. So it's bound, but I have these fields above it where I can do work, right? I can use this to interact with a fluorescent molecule to enhance fluorescence, couple the vibrational states for uh, surface enhanced uh, infrared absorption, things like that. Furthermore, I can get this wave to propagate extended distances. What extended means is very much dependent upon what your goals are. Uh, probably not gonna see on-chip photonic circuits uh, anytime with these systems. Uh, like we originally hoped, but you can get this to move over a distance, have a large interaction volume. Again, for like things like chemical sensing, this can work quite well. Uh, photonic interconnects and things of that nature. Uh, the other piece is that it maintains all the information of that photon. So when you outcouple it, it's polarization state, it's energy, it's uh, 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 um, uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum properties, all are maintained. So you can read it back out as if uh, when it went in. But there's, of course, the challenge uh, of we need to conserve energy and momentum. And so if I look at a dispersion relationship, in this case, remember my momenta is just the reciprocal, proportional to the reciprocal of my wavelength. So if I think of this, this is like omega eight equals uh, C over lambda. I've now linearized this by just making it the wave vector, right? And so if I think of light in free space, I just get this linear line, it looks like this. Increase my frequency, my wavelength's decreasing, my wave vector's going up. If I look at these plasmonic systems, I have this strongly coupled system. So down here, the mode is mostly light-like, so it's following this light line. But as I increase the frequency, the role of that charge becomes more and more important, and it starts to turn over. So out here, I'm very much charge-like, very short wavelength, but I have this huge momentum mismatch to overcome. So if I want to visualize this, if I'm here, I'd have an evanescent field above my surface with a much shorter wavelength than free space. But if I move out further along this dispersion curve, I can shrink that evanescent field, shrink that wavelength, and get even higher compression. So imagine it like a nanoscale magnifying glass. You know, all that electromagnetic energy, and I'm focusing it into a very tight spot. There's technologies currently, like in clinical trials from uh, Rice with uh, Naomi Hollis, looking at killing cancer cells by using that high electromagnetic field density. So we want to be out here, but of course that means my momentum mismatch is even bigger. So how do we overcome that to conserve energy and momentum? Well, I need to put a speed bump in the way, because if I don't, the photon's really fast, my charge is super slow, the photon zips right by, you never see it. If I put a speed bump in the way, I can slow that down, get them to come and couple for some finite period of time. And by doing that, now I can create this polaritonic mode and leverage its benefits for some finite period of time, usually on the order of picoseconds. 
So what are these speed bumps? Well, I can use a high index prism, effectively tilting my light line so that I can now couple to a higher, shorter wavelength mode in the medium. I can use grading, coupling in through diffractive modes into higher momentum uh, modes, or I can make nanostructures where effectively I'm picking a, uh, a point in uh, momentum space to make a resonant structure so I can scatter into that mode. Okay, so that's kind of the background. We're now hopefully all in the same place. I'm gonna start off by talking about a plasmonic system, which is uh, doped cadmium oxide uh, and its role for using uh, to create uh, uh, tunable infrared sources. Uh, this is in collaboration with my uh, uh, colleague at Penn State, uh, John Paul Maria and uh, his group, as well as also with a spinoff company that came from his group, Third Floor Materials. That's weird. Hold on, let's get here. So one of the reasons we wanna use cadoxide is if I'm looking at say gold, right? In the visible, gold is a pretty decent plasmonic system. It has a high carrier density, of course, it's a metal, right? But I can't do anything with it in the infrared very much. My permittivity is so negative that any structure I am going to use is gonna be much bigger than the wavelength anyway. It's basically more like an RF antenna than it is like a real plasmonic system. I also can't tune that around to make designs where I can shift through permittivity space. Highly doped semiconductors allow me to tune this plasma frequency by changing the carrier density. So one of the things that makes uh, cadoxide, two of the things that make cadoxide really interesting is a de de degenerately doped semiconductor. So I already have carriers in the conduction band. As I dope it, the intrinsic doping mechanism as it's grown is vacancies, oxygen vacancies. So as I'm introducing the dopant, if I choose my dopant appropriately, I can get that to fill those vacancies. And as I increase my carrier concentration, my mobility actually improves. So my loss drops, which is not unique, but pretty atypical from what you see in most semiconductors. Furthermore, because of a MOS bursting effect, the uh, effective mass of this system is relatively low and it's somewhat tunable with carrier density. As I change, uh, so because of that, that means small changes in the carrier density are going to have an outweighted impact upon tuning that plasma frequency. So between this, this means I have a relatively low loss plasmonic system, broad tunability. In fact, we've been able to demonstrate tuning from the long wave all the way to the near infrared, <clears throat> while maintaining losses that are commensurate with the best plasmonic systems. It's almost as good as silver, uh, but now operational in the, far, uh, the near to uh, mid infrared to far infrared. So one of the things we were tasked with was, can we make an infrared source there's, we took a lot of uh, guidance from thermal emission experiments from Jean-Jacques Graffet, among others, where basically you could heat up plasmonic or polaritonic systems, get them to emit into the far field. You can control resonances, make narrow band structures, but these all require lithographic fabrication. And if you wanna look at a lot of implications for where you could put in infrared technologies, if you're doing UV lithography, it's a non-starter because you need really cheap, if they're gonna go to that expense, they'll just use a QCL. They'll just use a laser chip. So if you want to find a market, it needs to be something that's going to be relatively inexpensive. So we challenge ourselves to say, can we do this with a planar film? Just something we can grow and go. And so we took some uh, uh, guidance from this beautiful paper by Campion. There's another similar one from Bassat, where if I take a plasmonic system or a polaritonic system, you can see I have this dispersion that looks like this, and my polaritonic mode is up here. What's not shown here is at the bottom of this, there's, of course, another polaritonic mode that's at the interface with its substrate or if this is just a bulk slab with air on the other side. Thus, as I shrink this down, what you start to get to is eventually the, uh, the absorption depth inside the material allows the plasmonic field up here to see the plasmonic field down here, and they start to strongly couple and form what's called an epsilon near zero or a Berriman mode. What this ends up being is in a layer that's roughly lambda over 50 with compared to the free space wavelength, you get a relatively non-dispersive, strong absorptive mode inside the volume of that platonic structure. So leveraging the loss in the system to actually make something that's useful, you now can get effectively a flat film that's gonna be strongly absorptive. So through Kirchhoff's law, strongly emissive, right? So now if I just simply heat this structure up, I can now get this to emit, but only at the frequency of interest. And so you can see some of the initial results here. This is actually prism coupling to look at the inside the light line, but it holds true on, uh, if you just do thermal emission. 
where basically by changing the carry density and the thickness, I can tune this ENZ mode or this Berman mode uh, with a relatively non-dispersive, which is basically going into a hemisphere. And so now I can make a relatively narrow band thermal emitter in a plane of film, but one of the, and you can even stack them. So if I grow one layer on top of the other, these are all the same material. The carriers are pretty, uh, are uh, maintained in the uh, given layers. And so you end up with the equivalent of three different emitters or a spectral band of whatever you want based off of where you put these resonance structures. The challenge is only p-polarized light is output. So I get 50% of the maximum black body emission out. So I'm limiting how much light I get out. And it comes out at roughly the Brewster angle. So 60, 65 degrees. So if I want to have something like a gas sensor where I want to use this, I want the light to go here and it's going like here, right? And so, so uh, when you say 50% uh, of the black body, that's um, that you would have expected at those frequencies or am I imagining I'm, you're compressing the black body? No, 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 yeah. So you basically, <clears throat> if I'm here, mm -hmm. the best you can do is that. Okay. Right? So it's whatever irradiance you can get at that specific frequency, that's what you can get out of this system. But you're just cutting out the rest of it. Yeah, you're basically turning it off so the emissivity is roughly zero and therefore you have a narrow band emission because of that. Um, and so we actually started working with third floor materials and they came up with this really beautiful idea of if we still take the same idea of taking a planar film, but now grow it on a patterned sapphire substrate, I can actually get cat oxide to grow on this because it's sputtered, which is another interesting property about it. It's high quality, even in high impulse magnetron sputtering. And by doing so, this texturing of the surface allows me to get to roughly 91% of uh, uh, black body emission at the, uh, at the resonant frequency along normal and almost 100% at 40 degrees while now making this normal instance. And the reason for this is both S and P polarized light can be outcoupled. And so now I have a thermal emitter that's relatively narrow band coming out normal to my surface and could be potentially used for chemical sensing. And so one of the simplest components that you can see in, uh, in infrared sensing is just what's called a non-dispersive infrared sensor. This is what it looks like. They're roughly three, four inches long, depending on what you want for your path length and sensitivity, maybe an inch wide. If you break inside, you effectively have a incandescent light bulb. It's except tuned at a temperature for the infrared. So it's relatively, it's a broadband light source. You pass that light through some gas cell, you bring in your process gas, and then I have an optical filter where that pass band is tuned to the vibrational frequency of some molecule I'm interested in, right? Let's say carbon dioxide. So only light at the frequency of carbon dioxide can get through to my thermal pot. And so I then just use Beer's law, see what kind of, uh, uh, how much of that gas do I actually have? Challenges with this are, A, this optical filter is by far the most expensive component in this. As soon as I make this, I can't make it work for another gas. It's working for this gas. Plus, if there's another chemical that has a similar vibrational resonance or one that overlaps, I can't differentiate. So if I can instead remove that and now use one of these very narrow band emitters, I can overcome this challenge, get rid of that filter, and potentially even make like three by three arrays of these where they're each going to have different vibrational spec uh, match to different vibrational modes, and thus be able to make this work for multiple gases in the same structure. And so we tested this. Uh, we used a gas cell in my lab. Long story short, it actually works quite well. If you compare it to a black body source with the uh, filter in place for CO2, even a slight detuning of this from the CO2 resonance, we get some better sensitivity than you get from the black body with the, uh, the, uh, the filter. And so uh, easily getting us down to into the uh, hundreds uh, of parts per billion at least. Um, we demonstrated this down to 50 parts per million with very easy sensitivity to go further. But this led us to a big challenge. Our line width, which is relatively narrow for a plasmonic system, is enormous when you compare it to a gas vibrational mode. So even though I can get rid of the filter, I can't differentiate, the, differentiate these gases. So my student Mingja took this over and said, well, let's see if we can find a way to make this more narrow and tailorable. And so he found this paper here, as did John Paul, uh, where they looked at this and said, if I take a photonic crystal, in this case, a distributed Bragg reflector, and I grow this on a conductive substrate, I can get something called a TAM plasma or TAM polariton mode. Effectively, you're matching the impedance of this passband to the polaritonic dispersion of this conductor. 
which results in a very narrow band emitter or a very narrow band that can be emitted or absorbed. Again, it's still planar film, so I can make this very large scale, very easy to grow. But the challenge previously had been by using periodic structures, I can get one emission band designed, uh, defined. We wanted to be able to match vibrational spectra for Gary. Yeah. So your in in your inner your, your original the the Cadox um, emitter that has a very rough or it has a very edged surface, yeah. right? In that case, can you still grow good black mirror on it? Yeah, on the uh, textured surface, it actually it's sputtered, so it is still. So you can still define a Brack mirror on top of that. No, oh, no, no, oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood the question. No, we're now going back to a planar. Oh, oh okay. So flat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. On that, no, absolutely not. At least not well. <laughs> um, so here we're going to take the tunable plasma frequency, the cat oxide, back in a planar film, and now use this DVR to define what those absorptive bands are. We know we can get to narrow band, but we want to do multi-frequency bands. And this means you need to use an aperiodic DVR, which of course, if I have nine layers of my DVR, carrier density of my uh, plasmonic material, 10 different parameters, God knows how broad of a space, for design isn't gonna work. And so Manja came up with this, he took a class, was interested in inverse design and machine learning, and developed this uh, 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 inverse design protocol, where effectively you design your structure and you start, you feed that structure using the material properties of these systems into a transfer matrix code, you calculate the reflectance and transmission, you then feed this in and it outputs what should the reflectance, transmission, absorptive spectra be. It then compares this to some target, measures the error. The stochastic part of this is it's just randomly sampling some version of the spectrum to ho hopefully avoid getting into like a local minimum, hopefully being able to find that global minimum. Minimum. You then apply a gradient to these, change the parameters, rinse, lather, repeat until you optimize the structure in what you want. And interesting enough, you can get very good agreement very quickly. In fact, this took a couple minutes on a laptop rather than months or weeks using more machine learning based approaches where you have to build up a model and really divine, uh, design off of that. And we could get exceptional agreement. So here we are looking to make a long wave thermal emitter. Here a mid wave infrared emitter for CO2 gas sensing. Here's one of those full wafer samples that we grew. This then allowed us to do dual band emitters. So we could design to match two different vibrational frequencies at once, two bands of a given molecule and one of another. So, whoops. And you can also arbitrarily control the line width, the amplitude, as well as the frequency. So you can basically design a spectrum that you want. In fact, here is a three close bands with designed uh, line widths that we wanted. Here's a emitter that's designed to work in the long wave, mid wave, and near infrared simultaneously for like barcoding information, matching a more complicated gas molecule, or even that of DMM, uh, dimethyl methylphosphonate, which is the nerve agent simulator. And so if you look, if I just use gold, I get this blue spectrum here. The tunable cadmium uh, plasma frequency of the cadoxide allows you to do this direct matching much better. So now I can get this red and black spectra to match quite well. And so this kind of really opens up the ability to now make arbitrarily complex spectra using this approach. Of course, you have no, it's inverse design. So once I've made it, I have no idea why it worked. So it takes a little bit of back reverse engineering to then figure out why is this working the way we want it so you can start to build up the design protocols to understand why. Yeah. Did you, uh, were you looking specifically for those cues or did you have kind of some like here? You know, yeah, we put yeah, in there or the one or the one on the right, the one thirty six to ten. Yeah, we were not designing for a specific. Key. This one, we just wanted a, a long wave, mid wave, and okay. near infrared, and we designed them, I think, all to have like fifteen hundred Q. But you getting it out here is tough, right? Uh, and so we just figured we're going to get the best we can. So you got, do you have like fun? So in terms of the Q, are you, you mainly looking for sort of some sort of rough boundary, and no. then you're mainly looking for the. In this case, we wanted to design. We wanted to show we could hit low to high Q within a very tight window, which is very difficult to do if you don't have some kind of design to do that. And so in your target spectrum, you're designing what you want. So here we set a constant frequency and just changed what, what line width do we want? Yep. And you can hit it one after another based off of what that periodic gradient looks like or a periodic gradient looks like. Uh, okay. Uh, so I wanna take the next little bit uh, the rest of the talk. And I'm just gonna focus on what we call hyperbolic platons, especially as we 
kind of look at these in the sense of more fundamental physics, fundamental material properties, uh, and how you can actually play with crystal anisotropy to kind of define optical uh, propagation. And so if I'm thinking of optical anisotropy, perhaps the most brilliant way to view this is just look at birefringence, right? And so if I look at diamond, of course, everybody sees this as a gemstone, right? It has an isotropic crystal structure, it's invisible or refractive index of about 2.4. It's that higher refractive index that gives this brilliance that everybody wants from it, where you get this kind of refractive property here, right? If instead I look at, in this case, this is actually 6H silicon carbide, I think. This is wrong. Um, this is the gemstone, mo gemstone moissanite. Um, because this is an anisotropic crystal, not only do you get with roughly the same refractive index, it's like 2.4-ish, you not only get that brilliance, but you actually get a prismatic effect. And this results from that birefringence. Effectively, the light is propagating along this direction and in plane at different speeds. So depending on which direction the light's coming from, you're gonna be separating that color out differently. And I always, I must have removed it because, uh, but uh, my wife's anniversary band is actually made out of moissanite, and she does know it. Um, but <laughs> it's actually much prettier than diamond. You can make them perfect, or pretty dang close to perfect. And it's like maybe 10 times cost. So and it's much larger. It can be, right? <laughs> that is a good point. I need to add that one in. Um, so we take that now to an extreme, right? Instead of just having the refractive index or so the permittivity being different along different crystal axes. What happens if it's metallic along one and dielectric along the other at the same point? This is what we call hyperbolic, right? And so boron nitride is an exemplary material in this regard. Basically, you have this van der Waals structure like graphite, where I have very strong covalent bonds between the boron nitrogen atoms in plane, and I have van der Waals bonds out of plane, right? So I get, end up with two sets of TO and LO phonons. I have, I have this upper Ristralin band here, where here's my TO phonon, here's my LO, and I have this lower Ristralin here, this is out of plane modes in comparison to in plane modes. And so if I look at this, what I find is that because of the vibrational modes in plane, I get this screening effect that causes that negative permittivity in plane, but out of plane, it looks like a dielectric. It's a positive permittivity. So it's behaving like a metal and a dielectric simultaneously. This is what we call a hyperbolic material. Now, why do we care? Well, if I look at a traditional isotropic medium, even one that's platonic, if I look at the dispersion, how you calculate the dispersion at any given frequency. So basically, what is my wave vector gonna be at any given direction? What I find is I get this isofrequency contour that looks like this. It's a face, effectively a hollow sphere. And it takes a long time to really be able to understand what the hell this is actually showing. But effectively, what it's saying is I can support a single wave vector mode, a single wavelength at that frequency, but I can make it propagate in any direction in space. It's not restricted to go only go along the x-axis, the y-axis. And so I come in at isofrequency, I have a single frequency, I have a single wave vector, I have a single wavelength. That's all it's in. Change the frequency, it might be here to here, right? I've changed that wavelength, but it's still a single frequency mode, a single wavelength mode. In these hyperbolic systems, when I have one of these negative and the other positive, you get these open hyperboloid shapes, which is where it gets the name hyperbolic. This is interesting because now I can fit arbitrarily high momentum modes into these systems, right? Limited only by the loss of the system. So effectively, this doesn't end, it just keeps going. Right? So I can go to higher and higher momentum, smaller and smaller wavelength, higher and higher confinement for my life. The thing you give up is a restricted direction in space. It can't propagate in all directions. The angle of propagation is actually restricted based off of the uh, square root of the ratio of the in and out of plane permittivities in these more simple systems. And so if I launch a plariton here, say by a gold disc, it's going to launch directly to the top surface at frequencies down here near the TO phonon. If I change that frequency, it's going to propagate at this broader, wider angle, continue out, and it goes to a broader angle. So technically, you're losing the ability to do this, but you can actually exploit this for things like super resolution imaging and what's called hyperlensing, among other effects. That I won't talk about today. But in the context of measuring these, we use a lot of what we call nano optic probes. These wavelengths are really small, they're like 100 wave number, 100 nanometers, 200 nanometers, sometimes even 50 nanometers. But my free space wavelength is 7, 10 microns. So we use what's called scattering type scanning near field optical microscopy. 
effectively, I'm coming in with a monochromatic laser, and I'm scattering this off of a metallized atomic force microscope tip that results in a strong evanescent field at this apex. And now I can use that strong evanescent field to then probe material properties on the surface, where now my spatial resolution is only limited by the apex, the radius of curvature of that tip, not by the wavelength anymore. And so I can roughly measure the infrared of reflection and absorption at that frequency, but now with 10, 20 nanometer spatial resolution. Um, I can also do this with what's called nano FTIR, where I come in with a broadband infrared laser, take the scatter light, pass it through an interferometer, and at a given point with that same 20 nanometer spatial resolution, measure an infrared spectrum. And more recently, we were able to add in a pump probe system where I can come in with either near ultraviolet, 390 nanometer, 130 feet per second pulse, or near infrared pulse, pump the system, and then monitor the infrared spectrum as a function of time with roughly 200 feet per second resolution. So inject free carriers into a semiconductor nanostructure and see how the carrier recombination is occurring within, uh, as a function of space within different uh, around uh, defects in semiconductors and things like that. So within two-dimensional materials, we'll use this tool a great deal because I want to measure the directly measure in real space what these polaritons look like. What does the wavelength look like? So if I think of sitting in a pond, throw a rock, and you can't see, how would you measure the wave? Well, you take your other finger and move it along and see where I get wet, you know, where I feel water, right? You could technically do this where I have one tip to launch, I come in with another AFM tip and raster around, measuring that uh, amplitude of that field. But of course, two moving AFM tips, eh, probably not your best move. So instead, we usually use an edge and we use interference. So we scatter the light off. I've thrown my rock in the water, but now it's coming to the, uh, 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 coming to the beach and it's now damping out or it's being reflected back and I can measure the interference of those waves and do that as a function of uh, spatial dimensions. So here's a boron nitride flake. I can raster across this, spatially map, Here's the edge of my flake. And this is now a real space image of the pluritonic wave propagating in boron nitride. And if I look at the distance between this, this is roughly half the pluritonic wavelength. So if you change your frequency, that wavelength is gonna change. I can do this several different frequencies and map out that dispersion as well. <clears throat> this also allows you to do things like uh, look at different phases. For instance, this polystyrene and PMMA, you can directly probe and map uh, distributions at very sub wavelength scales that you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. Okay, so going back to boron nitride, one of the big enablers that we had was working with Jim Eckert's group. He was able to grow isotopically enriched boron nitride. So it's roughly 99% or better than 99% boron 11 or boron 10. And as you can see from Raman here, naturally abundant is this purple guy here. It's roughly 80% boron 11, 20% boron 10. If you think of that, the masses are pretty low. It's 10 and 11. And so one AMU difference is almost 10%. And that's a mass defect. For a phonon, that's a lot of scatter, right? You in, remove that, you get a much narrower line width. You've increased the scattering lifetime because of the fact you've removed that scattering source. You can also see this in infrared by a huge spectral shift, as well as a higher fidelity of the mode, lower damping. And so if you look at what you expect in the lifetimes, if we get 100% pure, you might even get higher. But if, whoops, apparently I removed it. If you look at uh, uh, the infrared, uh, propagation of pluritons and boron nitride, we actually see that the pluriton also propagates three to four times longer. And so one of the things that's enabled us to do is we believe for the first time, this is unpublished, uh, is to be able to use pluritons to propagate heat. And so if you look, the first ex uh, experiment we have, this is in collaboration with Patrick Hopkins' group, he's basically doing time domain thermal reflectance, where he's coming in with an ultra fast laser pulse, he's hitting a gold slab, that's absorbing that pulse, it heats up. Roughly 50 to 100 picoseconds later, it's gonna to start to diffuse that heat across that interface, start to thermalize the boron nitride underneath, and we'd see a hot source. Yet instead, if I look at the change in reflectance due to that change, uh, that dissipation of heat, it's actually occurring at picosecond time scales, way faster than thermal diffusion across that interface can occur. And so our working hypothesis that we're trying to hammer out right now is that we heat this guy up, it starts to radiate, very quickly, and that radiation has a high momentum mode to it. It's in the near field, so we can launch these pluritons directly. And we can actually see if I probe out here, spatially delocated, uh, de uh, delocalized from my pump, 
I actually measure the hot spot out here at a couple of picosecond lifetimes, well before anything could actually diffuse across that interface. <clears throat> so we're trying to finish up some of the theory on this, but you can see this, whoops, you can see that here. For a very fast time scales, you see that the heat is being driven through a transverse optic phonon and this additional mode inside the Rastron band, which seems to be some population of hyperbolic polaritons uh, uh, being able to dissipate that heat. Whereas as I increase this uh, uh, time to 40 picoseconds, I start to get diffusion across that interface. I just see every mode participating at this point. It's not really uh, coupling to any given mode. And this continues even at thermal diffusive timeframes afterwards. <clears throat> and I think I'm pretty much out of time, right? How am I doing? Uh, keep going or? Let me take five minutes and I'll just show this and then I will finish up. So most of what I just showed you is all, while they're anisotropic, like boron nitride, it's still a pretty high symmetry crystal. If you think of symmetry of bonds, symmetry of like chemical structure, crystal structures, um, there's a lot of room to be explored when you start to go to lower symmetry crystals. What happens when these are so anisotropic that lattice constants are different, <coughs> lattice constants are different, sometimes even angles are different between, and they're not orthogonal. This kind of got motivated to a large degree, first by the hyperbolic stuff showing boron nitride had these naturally hyperbolic modes. You don't need to make metamaterials and things like that to do this. But then this paper uh, by Reiner Hillenbrand's group, there's another one by Wan Jun Chun uh, that also showed this in molly trioxide, which is orthorhombic. So basically A, B, and C axes are all orthogonal, but they're all different lattice constants. And so looking at the polaritons propagating in this medium, they saw a certain frequency bands Modes could propagate in both directions, X and Y, but they propagate with different wavelengths because the dielectric constants along those different directions are different. Furthermore, there's other specific frequency bands where you can only propagate a polariton in one direction. So now you can make this a directional transport that you couldn't achieve otherwise. So we collaborated uh, with one of the, uh, the folks from this group that's now faculty at uh, uh, University of Edo in Spain to basically extract this dielectric function, measure the infrared properties, correlate to the near field SNOM measurements, and go back and forth to identify to make sure that this is actually uh, descriptive of what's going on. And we can see that we can actually match to say prism coupled measurements as well as their SNOM measurements. But then this really motivated us to the more recent work, which is pushing beyond this, right? What happens when I go to non-orthogonal crystal directions, for instance, at a monoclinic crystal? And so if I look at an orthorhombic structure like alpha quartz or moly trioxide, as I said, all different, all three axes are different lengths, but they're all orthogonal. If I look at beta gallium oxide, for instance, this is a monoclinic structure. So A and C axes, I'm sorry, A and B axes are perpendicular, but the C axis is now at 103.7 degrees. Right? So it's no longer orthogonal and all three axes are different lengths. Why does that important? Well, if you start to look, one of the things that you could say is in both cases, there's bands where one of the directions is negative and at least one of the other directions is positive in permittivity. So it's gonna be hyperbolic. But more importantly, what I find is if I look at my permittivity matrix, my in plane here, right? is gonna be driven by a diagonalized matrix. I can isolate the X direction from the Y, right? If I'm polarized along X, Y is playing no role. If I'm polarized along C, and why X is playing no role. When one of these axes is no longer orthogonal, there's no direction in space in a Cartesian coordinate system where I can only look at that one uh, contribution to the tensor, uh, the tensor matrix. And so I have these off-diagonal components. What this means is that, as I showed you in my platonic dispersion, as I change my frequency, my wavelength is gonna change in any of these materials. This is very much just like free space. Change my frequency, my wavelength is gonna shrink. But in this case, what I actually find is not only is the wavelength going to change, but its propagation direction disperses with frequency. Effectively, those off-diagonal terms, there's lost components with them, and they actually induce a shear force upon the motion of the, uh, the light wave. And you're basically changing the direction of the phonon, which is causing a trajectory that's moving away from the original uh, uh, launched mode. And so we did this initially. Oops cut through, we call these shear platons because shear force on this. If I look at 
uh, uh, the dispersion measured through Crutchman configuration using a prism. You can see this asymmetry that results from this. This is just recently published uh, this past month. Uh, so there's no mirror symmetry. <coughs> it kind of mirrors, uh, mimics that of the underlying crystal structure. <coughs> I promise this is the last one. Um, pass this. And then very recently using the uh, free electron laser SNOM uh, that's at, uh, in Dresden, they can actually get down to the very far infrared to do SNOM measurements, even as far as uh, 100 wave numbers uh, uh, in the far infrared. And you can actually see this shear force in action in real space. So here I'm launching this mode. The color, you can't really see it here. If anybody really wants to, doesn't trust me, I promise you it's there. I can show you on my screen. Um, but this, basically this angle is being modified. And you can see this is a very small change in frequency. Furthermore, these modes propagate a pretty long distance. This is 10 microns. They're propagating like 30 or 40 microns in free space while still subdiffractional in nature. And so this is kind of opening up some possibilities of can I use this to redirect light propagation simply by changing frequencies through either external modulation cases or and still being able to maintain a reasonable propagation light. Furthermore, one of the things I'm really interested in Beta gallium oxide is a power electronic material that people are trying to understand. Mobility, carry density, these are all a function of direction now. And so can we use things like nano-optic probes and flaridons to actually probe these properties at a length scale that's really important for actual electronic devices, which you really can't do in infrared spectroscopy otherwise. All right, so with that, uh, this is my group. Uh, unfortunately, no longer is Tom in my group. He's actually a faculty member at University of Iowa. Um, Ryan is now with Andrea Liu at uh, uh, Cooney, uh, Cooney or CUNY, depending on how I'm inappropriately saying it. Uh, Joseph, uh, Mengzhi, and Guan Yu are both are all three senior students. Mengzhi drew uh, drove the, uh, um, uh, the narrowband thermal emitter work. Uh, Joseph is the one who's done a lot of beta gamma oxide work. Guan Yu, I didn't show his work, is basically spatial coherence using silicon carbide nanostructures. Uh, Scott, Ryan, and Katia. Uh, Lauren, Alyssa, and Autumn are all summer students, uh, or uh, Vanderbilt students who worked in my lab as undergrads. We're always looking for new additions, and now that COVID is hopefully finally over, visitors. Um, these are my kids at our nano day. <laughs> and then that, I have the uh, benefit of working with some fantastic collaborators who've really made a lot of this work. I'm here, hopefully, to add some faces to this. Uh, so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> You sort of already <coughs> alluded to this, but um, yeah, with the, when talking about the triclinic uh, materials, highly asymmetric, so you put that uh, permittivity tensor with the off diagonal elements on there. So the in that, given the fact that your system is reciprocal, the losses are not only there but are proof of that, right? Because yeah, yeah. if it's if you had a Permission, uh, it's not permission. Yeah. Reciprocal system, you can always rotate, right? Yeah, yeah. So, is, does that mean then? So, you get presumably you get really, really dispersive responses to this directionality. Yeah, right. usually dispersive. And can you kind it of? It depends on the band too, because it also depends on a how fast is the dispersion in that band, but then also how strong are the losses in that band. And of course, if you get too high, you don't see anything. So it's like right, some, the background loss beats the yeah. difference in loss kind of thing. Yeah. Um, no, so really this cool. is monoclinic in the right. triclinic system all off diagonal elements would be non-zero. And then right. this is kind of why like rhenium trichloride or some of these other systems where you could actually like, explore some of these modes in a confined system that's relatively good quality would be fantastically cool. And I think we're finally at the point where we could baby step our way to it. <laughs> and there's also in that, there's also, so you may have already done this, but if you haven't stuck the, the word exceptional point in any of the papers associated with that, do, do it, and, right. then, and then even if <laughs> it's the same paper. <laughs> and also, so all, the, all those measurements that are all um, with uh, mono or few layer crystals, right? Is that- No, they're bulk. Oh, you're doing those in bulk, okay. Yeah. So, so we, you can, how, how, yeah, how thick are- It's a substrate in this case. Everything I showed you to this point is a substrate. The SNOM, we basically patterned gold disks on the top surface so that they'd scatter and then we could measure. So these aren't even really like the volume hyperbolic modes. This is a surface confined mm -hmm. uh, mode. You can exfoliate it. It's weird. Molly trioxide is exfoliated for it. Molly trioxide, certainly. Those, oh, I'm sorry, the molly trioxide is flakes. That is two dimensional material flakes. Beta gamma mm -hmm. oxide is a bulk semiconductor system that is 
you know, being used in some power electronic devices already. But if you, the bonds determine which axis, it's the, it's whatever axis it is, it, the um, monoclinic direction is in the plane. So you can kind of come to a wafer and exfoliate off the side and then get these like crystal flakes that come off. Uh, and we've started exploring some of those. The challenge is you need, you know, to do SNOM, I need a really fine edge. And of course you can imagine I'm taking tape on the edge of a crystal. It doesn't happen very often. So we're trying to figure out fabrication for being able, can we etch that to get a really fine edge? Um, it's serving to be a real pain in the butt for fabrication perspective, but we're getting there, so. Have you guys packaged up this uh, machine learning DBR? Uh, yeah, it's design? open source on my website. And so it's, we, uh, Minx has already modified it for, uh, in one sense, to be used for detector design, uh, for basically matching emitter and detectors together, uh, incorporating third materials uh, to see if you can get like a, more of like a gradient rather than a discrete high low index. Um, trying to think of the, the, yeah, it's open source though, and it's just tied to another open source TMM code. And so we put it up there because we were hoping other people will take it and run with it. So cool. If you can't find it, let me know. I'll show you. So I've always wondered how SNOM works and it's still not totally clear to me. Do you have this metallic tip, mm -hmm. you shine a laser. And so what is, what is the role of the tip? Uh, how is it interacting with the material? Are you like making a plasmon on the tip and somehow launching it into the material or is it just yeah. serving as like a, People talk about the, you know, the um, the lightning rod effect and things like that. You can it, it, you can think of it. the easier way to me is if you just look at reflection off of a planar surface, right? If I reflect off the surface, I have an imaginary real part of that. The imaginary part is evanescent. It's very highly localized, right? So if I scatter light off of an AFM tip, I certainly have a lot of reflectivity, right? That's just far field reflectivity. That's my real component. But I have also that evanescent field. And ordinarily, we never see it because it only propagates like 20 nanometers from the surface before it decays. But now I have an AFM tip. It's like nanometers away from the surface and it's tapping, right? And so now, strong interaction, weak interaction, strong interaction. And so I look at that tip oscillation frequency and I can lock into it and I can demodulate out all of the far field reflected component. I throw that away. And so when you're seeing like a SNOM paper, they will usually publish with, we use the second harmonic of, uh, or the third harmonic, right? And that's just saying the tip oscillation frequency, they, they demodulated like the third harmonic of that tip oscillation frequency, throw away more and more of the far field. You can actually even play games where if I look at the, the first to the third harmonic, how much of the far field and near field components are present. And so you can start to change what you're actually probing by doing that, how tightly, how tight your spot is. With some of the more recent developments in lock-in technologies where it's 50 gigahertz or whatever now lock-ins they're crazy <laughs> uh, they're expensive as hell but they're they've been able to get up to i think like 13th harmonic uh is what hill and brand had reported you're looking at like a couple of nanometers of spatial resolution there um so yeah it's basically just you're playing with that evanescent field and which ordinarily you'd never consider because you're just looking at a reflective material it's not a player time that doesn't have to be you can get snob to work with a dielectric tip like a purely silicon chip. Your sensitivity goes down because your reflective component goes down and your losses go down, but it still works. Interesting. And what are the, you may have mentioned it actually and I missed it, uh, typical velocities for plasmons are? Oh, uh, so if you're looking at propagation of plasmon 10-ish, 10 times smaller than the speed of light-ish. It's still depending. really fast. It's still really fast. So photon flare time, so, it was measured in boron nitride by Hillenbrand's group. It's like 0 0.002 times the speed of light. It's still really fast. Because in some sense, I did, you're hybridizing like light and charge carriers, right? I kind of want to think you would be limited by the charge carrier velocity, right? But it sounds like you can- No, you're not limited by that. So you're they can move faster than the actual charge carriers. But you're slow with your light. Yeah. Your wavelengths in between as well. You're hybridizing the two, so you're getting like somewhere in the middle usually. Why? And so it depends on where you are in your dispersion. If you're very low in frequency and you're close to the light line, you're propagating exceptionally fast. You can see from the dispersion, your effective group velocity is the speed of light. But you also have no confinement compared to regular free space light. 
when I'm out here, if, especially if you go to really high confinement, I'm almost non-dispersive. My group velocity is extremely slow, right? So it does depend where you are in that dispersion, but you're sitting somewhere on that order. And so this is why, well, like from the thermal transport perspective, it's like ultra fast thermal, uh, th ultra fast thermal uh, uh, propagation. How much heat flux? Don't ask me yet. I don't know that. It could be completely useless. Uh, but if you think of like hot spots and like uh, 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 high frequency electronics or power electronics, I just want to dissipate heat really quick. It could be influential in that. We need to keep it from thermalizing back. So you need some kind of way to rectify maybe a gate separation or dielectric spacer that's very low thermal conductivity with a material as high thermal conductivity. We're not there yet, but I mean, showing you can propagate heat using light is in optic phonons, which actually have a really high heat capacity, but are, they don't go anywhere. There's no propagation. <coughs> if you hybridize this into a polariton, it now has group velocity, which is slow light, really fast phonon. <laughs> you want to shine out the end somehow. Huh? You want to shine out the end. Yeah, and I, it's not, it's going to radiate fast enough. Is there enough heat flux in that? I don't know. But certainly from a fundamental physics perspective, I think it's super cool. So, we'll hop. Huh? We'll hop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's super hot. <laughs> Wicked hot. <laughs> um, what, what happened if you have like atomic or structural defects inside your materials? That is something I really want to know. So we we have a paper using SNOM to probe um, uh, local changes in the infrared properties around defects in silicon carbide. Uh, basically, trying to use this as a metrology, uh, developing a metro new metrology, non-contact, non-destructive. Realistically, by collaborators or NRL from the group I used to be in, you know, make power electronic devices. What defect is killing your device? Well, let's make a thousand devices. We're going to measure them all, see which ones are bad, and then we're going to calculate how many, you know, do destructive characterization to figure out how many defects are in each. We're going to do statistical analysis, and then we're going to guess, right? If instead I can look at that individual defect and I can say, hey, in that defect, I have a very high increase in carry density, right? Oh, well, it's a carry trap. If it has a huge strain field around it, well, now it's probably going to be a hot spot that's going to be a breakdown at the point, right? Maybe we can start picking up some of that. We have a program right now looking at single photon emitters, like I mentioned this morning, that where we're hopefully trying to see, can we use both flaretons to probe the influence on that propagation? How does that change trajectory? How does that change the fidelity of the mode? But then also just, can I use this high spatial resolution from the SNOM and NOFTIR to actually probe, can I see a vibrational spectra from an individual defect? Yeah. That would be pretty awesome, right? And then you could gain, like, instead of doing a million DFT calculations of what are the possibilities, you could down select and say, well, now I know the vibrational frequency of that defect state. That's gotta be, you know, within these range of the masses, right? And so you could get a better feel for what would possibly be there. So I don't know yet though. Thank you very much.